The <coughs> following interview was conducted with Judith Myers Wells, Professor Emerita of C Child Development and Family Studies for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, um, May the 16th, 2011, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. <coughs> Let's start out. Tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Okay, I was born in Pennsylvania, as most of my family was. Um, my father was a pastor in a church, and so we didn't stay there terribly long. Uh, we were all born in Pennsylvania, but... Where was in Pennsylvania? Well, my brother was born in, in Maryland, but um, I was born in Roaring Spring, Pennsylvania. It's a place with a paper factory in the hills near Altoona, so in the western part of the state. Sure. And uh, lived there for four years, well, till I was five. Then we moved to Illinois, to a different church, was there for four years, and then when I was nine, we moved to another place in northern Illinois. This time he was taking a national position, and then he took a district position, and so we stayed in Elgin, Illinois, until I graduated from high school. Okay. Um, there are four of us in the family. I'm kind of the middle child of the first group, and then ten years later, I had a sister. So. Um, it's that kind of configuration. My mother um, did lots of jobs, was more than full-time, but rarely got paid for them. So she was kind of a professional volunteer, and when she was younger, she her goal was to become a pastor's wife, and that's what she became. Even though he moved out of the, pa the active pastorate in a local church, she still did a lot of things sure. in the local church and with other things that he was doing. Right. Um, and they are both still alive, and uh, 85, and they are they're sort of both 85 and they've been married for 64 years or something like that and they live together in a nursing care facility in northern Indiana so very nice we'll That's be good. headed there tell us a little about high school and uh, early uh, moving around you had different grade school or something I, I had I was in uh, a couple different grade schools but then I was in the same system and actually my father took his took his new job going from um, from the national job to a district job the year before I graduated and he probably would have the family probably would have moved then but because I had only one more year of school it, that was partly what determined the fact that he moved the district office to sure. where we were okay. um, and I was I was in a high school in Elgin Illinois Larkin High School um, and I I Any studied student? a variety of things okay. I was um, I took German I took, I took several music classes. I didn't have a lunch hour because I was taking both choir and orchestra, and that meant that they couldn't fit it in because of when this, those were scheduled. So I had to eat quickly in the equipment room before I went into orchestra. Um, and I, so I did some things with, with some theater things and so on. Um, I was involved in German club, that sort of thing. Okay. Was it um, a, lar uh, a large It was a large school at that point. It was a three-year high school, and we had um, close to 2,000 students, I think. Um, so it was a large school, very athletically, um, what do I want to say, a lot of equipment. And so... Lots of athletics. Lots of athletics. So we had a dance room, and I played field hockey, and I played... I missed tennis because there were too many gym classes at that point, but I played badminton, I did archery, I did golf, I did lots of things in high school PE. Um, however, that high school has now become a performing arts high school, so it's interesting how much that has changed. Yes, that's right. Oh, well, after you know, when you graduate, then what came next? Well. When I was, um, back up here a little bit, when yeah. I was two, my family had its first exchange student. Um, this was a, an exchange student from Germany. It was after the war, and they were bringing young men, and primarily young men, but they also brought young women, I think, from Germany to the States for healing after the war. And um, then after that, they had a, someone from Denmark, and then when I was a senior, we had a student from Germany. So after graduation, I entered a, an exchange program that is sometimes a high school exchange program, sure. but um, because I spoke German, I asked to go to Germany, Switzerland, or Austria, and I went to Switzerland. Um, and I, I assumed I would lose the year academically, um, but I was in a tr teacher's training school there I was with mostly students who were a couple years younger, but I took all the academic subjects, except they didn't put me in, um, what was it, 
one of the science courses. I took botany, but I didn't take, I think it was the, the more advanced math course. Anyway, they were all in German. I would take my notes phonetically and then go home with my dictionary and try to figure out what I wrote down. Um, it was a, very didactic, so that helped. But I, um, I took my first psychology-like class there. Um, it was pedagogy. And then when I, um, well, I was ready to go back. I was accepted to college before I left. So I wrote back to the college, Manchester College in northern Indiana, and said, remember me? I've been on an exchange year. Am I still accepted? And they said, send us your transcript. And I was surprised they did that. They gave me um, a year and a third credit for one year of work in Switzerland. And that meant that then I went through Manchester College in two and a half years and got my bachelor's in psychology. Oh. Um, How did I, you happen to select Manchester? Um, it's a denominational school okay. with the Church of the Brethren. That's okay. where my father was a minister. So my uncle had gone there. My mother had been a house mother there. Uh, my grandfather and my grandmother and great aunt had all gotten degrees from a college that fed in eventually merged with Manchester College. Um, so there was so a lot of family. You there know, was a lot of family about the school. There. Right. Okay. And it's a small school. It yeah. has um, approximately a thousand students. So it was half the size of my high school. It's in a small town with about 5,000 people. I guess it's a little bigger now. Um, so it was, it was an interesting adjustment, but they were very generous with my credits. And I had a great experience there. I, I was able to do orchestra and choir, but not very long because I was... And you lived on campus. I, I lived on campus for, um, for one year. One and a half. Anyway, um, I think it was one year, and then I w there was a group of us um, who really were committed to uh, communal living and speak. You know, we were 60s kids, and we did a proposal to the university that we wanted to live in a house together. Uh, seven of us wanted to rent a house and really live the kind of life. We wanted to learn how to carry out the lifestyle that we wanted. So we baked our own bread, and we made our own cottage cheese. Like the co-op. Uh, like a co-op, sure. yes. Um, it was male and female. OK. And it apparently um, stirred up some concern among alumni. But we lived there for a year. And then you're not allowed to live off campus until your senior year. So oh, okay. um, that was one reason why we had to get permission. And then um, the last year I was there, I think I moved six times to different apartments. and. Um, I graduated after January term. Um, they, they have a, two semesters and then a January term. And for that Jan term, I did a, an internship in um, a couple of schools in northern Indiana, uh, nor, no, northern Illinois, um, looking at um, different issues with children. Actually, when I was on campus as an undergraduate at Manchester, one day there were some kids around, and I was kind of struck with the fact that this is, a, this is an um, age-related ghetto here. This is all students, and I miss kids. And so I, I started really focusing more on right. child psychology and so on. And what's interesting is um, our professor brought in his baby, put it on the blanket during ch child psychology class. That baby is now my parents' physician. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> because my parents are now in that community in yeah, the right. retirement home, which is also denominationally related. Sure. Um, so um, then for that next year, I stayed in, well, let's see, I, I graduated in January. What um, year did technically, you from? that was in 1974. Okay. Right. And then I stuck around for about a year and a half. In for, Manchester? In, in Manchester, but I worked in Wabash and Fort Wayne. Um, in Wabash, I went back to a home that we had visited. At that point, it was called a home for severely and, <laughs> severely and profoundly retarded children. It was basically a nursing home for children with um, very, th they were very needy when it comes to care. And I liked the way they handled them. So I applied, and of course, I was overqualified, but I started working as a nurse's aide for minimum wage, which at that point was $1.70 an hour. And uh, within a couple months, I was promoted to director of their therapy program, which was really just the higher, um, the higher functioning kids. The first day I worked in that job, they had thrown all these higher functioning kids in a playroom and said, here, 
do something with them. I came back the next day with a list of questions saying, what kind of activities should we be doing? What is our backgrounds? What, you know, what kind of philosophy should we be following? All these kinds of things. And that's when they made me director of, the, of that program. You had the right questions. The thing you didn't answer. Yeah, sometimes asking questions gets you as far as answering them. Yeah. Um, but it, this, was a, this was a really interesting time because it's right around the time that the law passed that all children needed to be educated in the public school system. So here was this home with a whole lot of kids in a relatively small school system, <clears throat> and they had to figure out how to deal with them. Basically what they did is they went to the home and said, we will hire some teacher's aides to work with the kids. Um, they had not been going to school? They, well, they were, oh, they, schooling okay. was really not. Sure, I understand. Um, no, 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 there were a, a few kids who could get some instruction, but most of them it was occupational therapy and physical okay. therapy that they were getting. <clears throat> and they did need more. And some of the kids could, could do more than they had been doing. But um, this happened while I was in this uh, head of the therapy program um, position. And then they started hiring these teacher's aides. I didn't have a teaching degree, so I couldn't be hired by the school. So I was the supervisor for the teacher's aides. Um, I knew a number of them. I mean, I. We did some creative things. I felt I took the kids out. I took them to the Fourth of July parade. We had one little boy. His his only words were "Hi, girls," probably from hearing the aides come in and greet them. But he also had very long, skinny arms, and he would shake hands. So this little kid shook hands with all the politicians at the Fourth of July parade. Um, we took the kids to the animal shelter, um, and some of the autistic kids were more interested in the gravel than they were in the animals, but. That was fine. We took them to the local pool, um, and we took them before the pool opened, and they had a waiting pool. We had one child who was post-tetanus, who um, couldn't talk, couldn't move much, but clearly was with it a lot more cognitively than anyone could quite get into. Um, we put him on his stomach on a life raft, and in the waiting pool, he could use his good right arm and push himself around. He loved it. Um, we took him out, uh, one of our male aides took him out, we took him back to the dressing room and the other kids were starting to come in. And the, here was this African American kid with all these constrictors, um, shivering because he didn't want to get out of the pool and loved it and was cold. Um, and one of, the other, one of the kids who was coming into the pool said, what's wrong with him? And um, the aide said, oh nothing, he's just cold. And I'm thinking, what did that kid think was going to happen to him when he got cold? But anyway, he, we really tried to normalize these kids in the community. Give them some exposure. That's right. right. This was a for-profit institution, and there were various issues that went on. Some of my friends worked there, and they were trying to unionize the group. I was brought in as management and told to squelch the union. I mean, there were, there were these political issues going on. Um, I pushed. I, I had the first parent meeting. They had never brought the parents in. Most of the kids were wards of the court. But I invited the parents in, showed them a slide shed, set of their kids, played Carol King's Child of Mine, had all the parents crying. But it, it was a great way to talk some about what we do with their kids right. and so on. And they, just, they didn't get much involvement in the home. No, they were, many of these parents had been told, put your child in a home and forget you ever had him because he'll never do anything. And many of the kids did much more than the doctors had predicted. Oh, this wow. was an early yeah. point in the mid-70s sure. when it comes to understanding special needs. Working with the, uh, the child. Yeah, one of the, the sets of parents had two microcephalic kids. Um, the older one was now in school and walking. They had placed the younger one when we had this meeting, they took him home because they said, we can now handle him and we miss him and we want to take him home. This is a for-profit institution. Sure. I mean, so that was not necessarily what they wanted. They wanted the beds filled. Uh, they would do things like adoptable kids. They would make it difficult for prospective parents to come in and adopt the kids because they wanted to keep the beds full. Um, and then we ended up with an issue with me supervising people in a system that I wasn't part of. And I was signing their time cards, but I wasn't part of the schools. And anyway, um, I made a decision. It was a weekend. I hadn't, didn't have a chance to talk to the superintendent about it, but the owner of the home was there. He decided I was overstepping my bounds and fired me. So I was fired from that job. It was probably good. Um, it, was, it was tough at the time, but then I looked for other jobs. This was right before Christmas, 
and I, I felt somewhat vindicated because I was granted unemployment insurance, but I didn't need it because I got a job as a house parent with what was called pre-delinquent teenagers, a little um, prediction of the future, I guess. Um, so I worked in a unit with, um, with 15 to 18-year-old boys, and I had a partner who was male, and they tried to have male-female partners in each of the units, but it was a co-ed institution. They took them as young as, I don't know, uh, 10 or 12, I'm not sure, uh, but they were divided somewhat by age. And um, I was on four days in a row, 24 hours a day, and then off you for four You lived in the days. house? Lived, because I was the female in a male place and was not married to my partner, I lived in another apartment on campus. But then I came over for breakfast and Spent I left the after they were to bed. So I, w I was basically there except for sleeping. At least I had a little bit of a break. Um, however, we were concerned at one point that the boys were sneaking into the girls' units. So I had a friend who was a female um, house parent in an, a girls' unit. So we decided to booby trap the door. You couldn't lock them because of uh, fire restrictions. Um, but I was stayed with her, and we heard the booby trap go off, and we caught the younger boys, not my older boys. And while we're trying to corral them, they're sneaking out and escaping, and we lost them all before the end of the night, um, before we got their house parents over there. But then most of them ran away um, because their house parent has said, you better not ever do that or, you know, so. I understand. So they ran away. And then um, at one day, my, my house, in the morning, the two leader kids in our group had run away. And then in the morning, run away from the, run away from the institution. And there also was a false alarm in the morning. The fire department called everybody to the courtyard and said, this is a terrible thing to do and don't do it. And um, by the way, we couldn't get the system turned off without turning it off. So if there's a fire, you'll have to call it in. So everybody's all hyper with all this stuff going on and my house parent partner and I are talking and kids are messing around in the hall and we look out and try to settle it down. And then all of a sudden they knock on the door and said, there's a fire. So um, we got everybody out, and call, I fall, called the fire department, and uh, we're all standing around. Fire department comes and works on our, on our unit. We ended up having to move to, there was a, a place that looked a little bit like a motel, which used to be a, um, an unwed mother's home, but this was around the time where they were all closing because girls were staying in school. And so that was available, and we moved there, so I ended up staying overnight with the, with the boys then. Well, we, we found out what happened is that the, the kids were, were hyper, and they were saying, oh, they've turned off the fire system, so now we can pull the fire alarm. So they pulled the fire alarm, and there was an automatic refit, reset mechanism, and they thought, oh, no, it's been fixed. We're going to be in trouble. So they decided there should be a fire. Oh, my God. So they went to a stuffed chair in the solarium, which had windows around two sides, wood paneling, and set the chair on fire. By the time they realized the fire department wasn't coming, it was blazing to the ceiling. So, and of course my partner had to run someplace else to find a fire extinguisher because we were in a unit with teenage boys and couldn't leave that out. So anyway, we had lots of experience. I had so many intensive experiences in five months. I've been able to tell those stories for <laughs> years. But then I, I had applied to many schools. I, did, I thought I wanted to be a child clinical psychologist. Those programs were harder to get into than, uh, than law school or medical school at that point. And I would be in the second group, not the first group, you know, that kind of thing. So I had, I had applied to the psych program here at Purdue, but I thought, eh, I'll also apply to special ed because that's what I've been doing for the last year and a half. Right, yeah. And I got into the special ed program here. Um, in many ways, you know, it's not what I had wanted, but I thought I'm ready for grad school. I'm tired of applying and not getting accepted, so I'll go. Um, so I came starting in May of 75, and um, I took some summer courses, and then in the fall, there was a grant going on called, uh, let's see, the, it was called uh, FEAT, 
facilitating educational attainment through telecommunications. And there was a special ed professor who had, who had a contract from the government to produce videotapes that could be shown on public access TV to help parents with special needs kids, really high needs kids, to learn how to do some basic skills with, skill development with them. And they found out I had that experience with special needs kids, so they put me in the tape room. So this was when the TV studio was over where, um, they're at the corner of Northwestern and Grant uh, in some of those, those. Um, oh, in the, uh, t uh, where, where uh, Armstrong Hall is? Yes. And the where yeah. Creative Arts was. Where, where they had, those, yes, the, one, just like Creative Arts in one of those temporary buildings. Temporaries from World War II. That's right, you that's right. You. And so the studio was there, but I sat in the basement down here in the tape room watching what they were doing and what they wanted me to watch for is when they were stimulating um, reflexes instead of getting real motor responses, that sort of thing. And I ended up doing writing with it and so on. And they basically hired me full time. But I was also taking classes in sure. special ed. And within a year and a half, I had gotten basically everything except student teaching. And I didn't have a teaching degree, so I really couldn't have done anything with it but I had discovered child development and family studies, which I hadn't known anything about before. So I applied there. They at thought Purdue. At Purdue. And they thought I was, uh, I was trying to come in for the doctoral program. I already had a master's. And I said, no, I'm starting over. But they gave me a lot of credits. Um, so I started there and uh, ended up being assigned to the cooperative extension specialist who worked with child development. And he had a similar background with some educational things he had done in the past. And um, I ended up getting an assistantship with extension. Didn't even know what it was before. Um, I grew up in the Chicago area, so I, yeah, didn't, right. I, I didn't know anything about that. And um, really enjoyed that. And he had done some things with parenting. So um, right, yeah, yeah. I got involved in parenting. And then I, I got through my doctoral program in four years, even though I was in two different departments and was working full time that first year, and then got a three quarter time assistantship at the end and so on. Um, partly, well, partly because both in my undergraduate and graduate work, I would go to my advisor and say, I think I want to go part time next semester. And they'd say, oh, just do another semester full time. They, they pushed me along, and I got done really quickly. Um, and then my major professor, um, he stayed with me through my That's three years. That's one of Yeah, the, uh -huh. um, Ray Coward stayed there for the three, well, he stayed there for like a little less than two and a half years when I was there, and he took a position in, the, in New England. And so he left before I was done, but stayed active with, through the mail, and sure. didn't have email then, um, and came back for my final meeting and so on. Um, but he left the position open, and he encouraged me as I was graduating to apply for that. I did, and I was not the first person interviewed because they were nervous about hiring their own. They had to interview some other people, but I clearly understood the position because I had been sure. an, an assistant with that position, and I really enjoyed the connection between academia and outreach and using a strong research base to do applied work with people who need the help, right. and especially with parents. So um, they did hire me, and actually um, the, my hire date was September 1st to make sure that I would get my, get my dissertation done beforehand. And the department head was one of my committee members. He had hired me, so he kind of had some pressure to make sure that it was successful. And um, so I started on September 1st of 1979. Let me, uh, for the researchers, when they think of extension, I mean, uh, you clarify because they think of the egg, but you, extension in part of the department, just clarify that. You, um, you did a little bit of both. Ex well, it, there are different models of extension. Right. Um, extension in general is the outreach arm of the land grant university. Correct. And so going way back to when it was the law was passed, right? And it's and that has continued. And sure. there are land grant universities in every in every state and Guam and right. Virgin Islands and um, right. a few okay. other places. And um, it's connected with the land grant university because this it was created because 
it was trying to get away from the British model of kind of elitist education and focused on all on humanities and that sort of thing and really try to get at practical things that people needed for their jobs. So that's why agriculture is the primary base of extension because that was what most people did when it was created. And 4-H was created because that was a way to get at the parents through the back door, get the kids to do the new practices and then the parents will. It's much more of a youth development program now than it was then. Um, and Home Ec Extension was really founded as a way to get them to use the food appropriately and to do safe the things and hygiene and around the home. The home. Whatever. That's okay. right. Okay. Um, and it, it became, well, anyway, that is housed obviously sure. in CFS, which turned to CFS just before I joined the department. Um, it was Home Ec before then. Norma Compton changed it to CFS. Um, the model we have, let's see, there, there are educators, they were used to be called agents, um, in every county, pretty much across the country, although there are some states that are backing off on that, um, that are employees of Purdue, of the land-grant institution, here it's Purdue. So in Bloomington we have a Purdue employee who works with Cooperative Extension, several of them actually, and um, it's their job to work directly with the people, the specialists are to have the connection with the other land-grant universities, with the research base, to do trainings, um, to be their, their link with the research base. Um, and we also do some direct programming. There are several models of how that's done. When I started, most programs were separate extension departments. And people who were in extension in all the areas, ag and home ec and youth, and some of them had public policy, um, some other kinds of areas. Now they've got some health areas and so on. They were all in a department by themselves and went up for promotion and tenure against that department. Um, in 1970, so a little bit before I started, um, Purdue started placing the specialists in the departments. So my job was 100% extension, but I was in the academic department and had to go up for promotion and tenure right, in that academic department. Now that becomes an issue because a lot there you're going up with a committee of people who don't really understand what you do and they don't do that kind of work. But it I think it's probably the best model because then you get people who really understand the research and don't get pulled in by pop psychology and other sure. kinds of trends. They have a good strong base. Um, but it does get really tough when it comes to promotion and tenure sure. and that's why I'm not a full professor. Um, they didn't get what I did and were trying to apply the same criteria and uh, models and approaches sure. as the rest of the faculty. Okay. Let's talk a little about some of your research. I uh, picked up a couple. One, I thought that Christmas toys was one. I, I did a number of releases on Christmas toys. Actually what happens when you're in extension, you work a lot with the media and I'm very comfortable working with the media so I've done lots of things. And some of it would, would be we would provide ideas for newspaper articles and so on for the counties to use. But every year um, there would be things related to each of the holidays. So preparing kids for school and what to do with kids over the summer and Christmas gifts and um, what do you do during cabin fever in the winter. You know, all of those things you always had to look for a new twist. Um, that's one kind of thing what that you work with <laughs> is, is the new twist of the, of the perennial things. And then the other thing that I really started doing was looking for events in the news that kids may react to, that parents need to be aware of, or things that might affect parents. So I started sending out news releases about Jim Henson dying and the fact that kids are going to be confused. Did Kermit die? What does that mean? Jim Henson's son was close enough to him in voice that kids probably didn't even notice. Um, and the, the shuttle blowing up and those kinds of things became things that I would send yeah, out I did news my research. I know you've done those. And, and there's a need for it. And you get, right. did you, you would, they would come to you or then? You, um, a little you bit of both. Sometimes you anticipate that. Well, we were told as extension specialists that we should try to take the initiative to sure. do some news releases. So we would have, actually what's interesting is at the beginning, I would talk about, well, I was called by Parents Magazine fairly early in my career to answer some of their Q&A sure. items, that right. sort of thing. Um, and I would talk to 
the news people we were working with within ag communications and say, we should really push this more. It's a way to get the information out. And I was told by the person I was working with that it's our job to work with the state, not nationally. So we, we don't do that. Now, that definitely changed, sure. but obviously our, all our borders have changed. But, um, yeah, we had certain people who were our contacts, either in the University News Service or in ag communication. Again, most of it was ag communication at first. And they would ask for new ideas. Sure. They, at, the, at one point, at, near the beginning, they used to do something that I can't believe we'd do. They would send us very short news clip, re, news release clip kinds of things from other states. And we'd have to choose the ones that we thought were appropriate. And these things had quotes in them with blanks. And they'd have the quote, and you'd fill in, the county educator would fill in his or her own name. And then as media got more global, I mean, people would realize, hey, I saw this quote from somebody else in another paper. We're not, you know, so we had to stop doing that. It really was not a very ethical practice. Uh, but we do that, and I'd get it both ways. Yeah. I would have people call with sometimes bizarre questions, and you learned how to steer that in the direction sure. that was appropriate. And I ended up then doing some trainings for colleagues nationally and locally um, about how to deal with reporters and, and how to – well, I wrote some articles with some colleagues about using mass media uh, some right. of that started yeah, very early. Yeah, you've done some mass media education. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, another one that you did is play is, is important. It's so important. We, um, we did play at several different levels. That's a, what we do is take some basic child development concepts and put it in a form that the public would be able to understand. So uh, play is a big one. I did a series of, well, when I was in school, I had taken, um, I had, I'd really been interested in parenting. And then I took the adolescent development class and we had to do a project. And I thought, let me combine my interest in, in parenting with this assignment to do adolescent development and talk about teen parenting. And so that ended up being a big part of my graduate work and moved into my work professionally. Um, I ended up working quite a bit with adolescent pregnancy and parenthood mm. um, throughout my career, basically, but heavily at the beginning. And, a co well, a 4-H educator in Indianapolis was interested in doing some of this work as well. And we looked at some grant application options, and we decided to make some proposals that could go together but could still be done if they didn't both get funded. So she proposed a program called Mentor Mother, which matches, it's like a big sisters program with uh, pregnant teens, pregnant or parenting teens, and often parenting in our program, and um, volunteers who worked one-on-one -on -one with them. And um, I did a proposal to create materials to train teenagers about parenting skills. They both got funded, and I, well, both of us ended up working with some with both, but she worked primarily with Mentor Mother. I worked with both. And um, my, my programs that I came up with were written materials, written at a second to third grade reading level, which is challenging, um, and videotapes to go with them. So we did six of these, uh, funded through a maternal and child health grant, and um, they ended up, we sold hundreds of thousands of copies of the, oh, of the written materials and thousands of the, uh, the videos. There really was very little out there. And what people would do in writing at an easy um, reading level is wash out the content. And I was bound and determined not to do that. We did a content um, analysis first. What do we know about this topic, like play, and came up with the big ideas and then tried to figure out how do we say that in a simple way, not how do we talk to a second or third grader. How do we use second to third grade reading level as if you're talking to someone who doesn't speak English well or something sure. like that. Right. So they got used with middle class parents too because they liked how easy it was to read it. But um, anyway, we, I did a lot. Then play was one of those. Um, eating was one of the, you know, feeding children. And social support was one and stress management, um, and normal child development, and um, networking and using resources in the community. And what's interesting is then when we moved 
I, I was working with three other uh, specialists from other states to look at what is the core of parent education. And uh, we came up with the National Extension Parent Education Model, which um, we, again, looked at the research, tried to figure out what are the key parenting practices that seem to be critical in raising kids who are caring, competent, and, and healthy. And um, we came up with 29 practices in six areas. And what's interesting is that that was way after I had done A Child in Your Life with those six topics. And basically the six topics were the six areas in our National Extension Parent Education Model. But that model is still being used. Um, it is it is those 29 practices, not for parents, although sometimes people have figured out a way to use them with parents, but as a way to guide our programming. We put objectives to go with each of those, sure. and that was a way for program planning and for program development. It was a way to look at your library and see, do we have all of the areas covered, and that sort of thing. And then I got together with another group of educators. There were eight of us that time. Eight is too many for a project, let me tell you. Um, but we came up then with the skills that are critical for parenting educators. So again, there were six categories, uh, very similar, but there are a few more of the specific practices. I'm thinking there are 36 or something like that. And um, those are what we need to do as professionals to effectively reach the, the parents. And that then became a the basis for some people um, in different states to create training programs for parenting educators very and, good. and so on. So you should be very pleased. That's for, great. That's it's been great that that has been such a success. That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, communication is, and that comes through in many of the things that you said, really, and it strengthens your family, and you sort of address that. Right. So we That's talked true. about so true. about how to communicate with children, how to communicate within um, within parenting relationships. Uh, we I think communication is important as professionals dealing with the people that you're you're educating. So uh, the basic communication skills have been it's so easy to apply them across many different settings. All right, which you've been able to do. Uh huh. Right now you're. Uh, um, couple of your books at uh, Young Peacemakers Project book. That's pretty good. Um, a colleague, well, a, a college, yeah. two college friends and I um, talked about, we, um, our denomination, uh, the Church of the Brethren, is one of the, tr the traditional peace churches, along with the Quakers and the Mennonites. And we had been raised that way. And actually, I, you know, I was very conscious of the fact that this is a public institution and tried to keep some of my personal, um, my personal inclinations kind of aside and do kind of a more general neutral education, but providing a number of uh, options and so on. But sure. then I started getting asked to do things in, uh, with nonviolent parenting and that sort of thing. And I discovered that people were very interested in that. So I started incorporating that. And then um, these college friends <clears throat> and I talked about um, what can? What about putting together some of our ideas? Both of them were in early childhood education, and um, let's put together some things that help parents educate their children about how to be peacemakers. So we created, we started to create one book, and they said there are too many for one book, so we split it into two. Um, we ended up going with a denominational publisher, uh, but it got picked up by national early childhood sure. publishers, um, and we came up with activities for three to ten year olds. Um, I, I just taught a course actually at our seminary um, a couple years ago and I made our book one of the textbooks and it was a little sobering to find out you can now get them on Amazon for a penny a piece. Um, obviously used, but um, <laughs> anyway, they, they did sell very well and they, the activities are still fine. Some of the introductions to the chapters are quite dated considering that was in the 80s. But um, one of my friends was an artist, and she drew the pictures for it. And the other uh, came up with a lot of the ideas. I did a lot of the writing because I had more writing experience. Sure. But um, that, <clears throat> that was a really fun project. Yeah. We had got a letter from one teacher saying, I've never had so much fun teaching as when I used your book in the classroom. And <laughs> That's that kind the kind of thing you like I'd to love hear, to hear right. that kind yeah. of thing. Um, <clears throat> well, and the other one that you did, that Family as Educators for Global Citizenship, 
Now, that came from a conf an international conference that I attended. I think because I had done some work in this area, I, I did my first study with parents and children, how they talk about war and peace issues in 1989, mm -hmm. and started publishing some of that. And there really was very little out there about that. There were a lot of things about how children understand the topics, but they never involved family issues. So bringing that in uh, changed the, the focus. And um, Robert Rappaport, who was actually from the States, from, from Harvard, um, had moved to London. And he was doing a number of things on families and society and that sort of thing. He was pulling together an international conference related to the International Year of the Family in 1994. And he um, was inviting people to come to this conference in Budapest. And um, one, I was one of the people he invited. So he had about 30 people from 20 different countries. And we decided that we wanted to try to do two different things as a result of that conference. One was to create a volume that presented all of the ideas and Robert Rapp report. Yeah, yeah. Right, and, and the things that went behind his thinking before that, I think. So Robert Rappaport was wanting to write that. But we wanted a compilation book that came out of the ideas of the different participants. Um, I offered to help do that. Um, the other person who offered to co-edit it was from Budapest and actually had been a visiting professor in our department, so I knew him, and that really helped. Um, so I was working at this, but, well, there were um, facts and email really made a difference. Not, it was not as smooth as it is now. Obviously, we didn't have Skype. Though there were not those kinds of things available that would have been wonderful. But um, we did pull together 30 authors from about 20 countries. Um, because I was the English speaker uh, among the editors, I ended up doing a lot of the editing, and it took us six years <laughs> because we'd lose people, and, and we're really trying to include as many people as possible. Um, and a, a year or two, be, maybe three, before we finished, Robert Rappaport was doing some work and fell off a ladder and died. So um, we were especially committed, and we actually added a, a dedication section at the beginning <laughs> so people could comment oh, on right. how important Robert Rappaport was to you this project. You could write how the book was done. That oh, was, I tell was, you, I learned a lot. Um, but I feel, I feel good about what we came up with. It had economists and sociologists and psychologists and demographers and people from Africa and Asia and Europe it was worth it. and the States. I think it was worth it. Sure. Um, now, we, Robert helped us find the, um, the publisher for that, and we ended up going with a relatively small publisher that specialized on um, small market international works. So I don't know exactly how much it was actually used, and we didn't get the, the proceeds from it. Um, but um, it was interesting because it was a British publisher, and we had to use British guidelines and produce camera-ready copy. So my secretary learned a lot, too. She was wonderful. Um, and the one typo I found is in my chapter, so I guess that's, that's good. Um, <laughs> But that, that was a really interesting thing to look at, and that kept broadening my thinking about these sure. issues. The uh, internet, uh, for that International Year of the Family, did you do anything special? Did you have any special programs or anything here? Or? We did several things. We did, for the original uh, year, we worked with a lot of the counties, had, gave them lots of materials. I had some students produce some materials that they could send sure. out and use. I, I actually went to another conference related to the International Year in Costa Rica. So I had some connections and ideas with those people. That was at the, um, at the um, University for Peace in, in, in um, Costa Rica, which is supported by the UN, but actually primarily by Finland and some right. other Scandinavian countries. But that was also a really good experience. But um, yeah, we created newsletters and, and activities, and we collected all that information. I was part of um, the International Year of the Family planning group with the National Council on Family Relations. Um, so we had a number of things going, and then with the 10th anniversary um, in 2004, we sent out another round of things to newsletter ideas, things sure. that they could, that people could use. I did state fair exhibits related to it, and so Sounds on. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, were you ever fact fellow at any of the residence halls? Or, you know, no, I wasn't. Okay. Let's talk about family. Okay. Um, go ahead. 
Um, I started, let's see. You have a couple children. I have two children. Uh, my husband and I got married while we were in grad, while I was in graduate school. You met him here? He, I met him actually in Manchester, um, North Manchester, Indiana, when I was in school. He was not a student there, but he was a good friend of one of my uh, fellow students there. And uh, he followed me down here. We got married when I was in graduate school. And then um, I got pregnant a couple years into my job here. And it was interesting being in a Department of Child Development and Family Studies when you have a child. Um, I would have some fellow faculty members. Well, I took my daughter along to work the first six months. Um, and that generally worked very well. There were a couple people who were uncomfortable with it. But in general, it worked really well. I'd have faculty members knock on the door saying, I'll take her, and they'd walk off with her. And uh, somebody found an old baby buggy in some of the closets around the, the preschool and brought it up so I could put her in it in, the, in my office. Um, when she started rolling both ways, I thought, okay, now it's not going to work in here anymore. She's going to roll under the desk or whatever. So um, I started her in child care at that point. But we put her in the, actually, I had put her in the infant lab in both morning and afternoon programs. So I did have some times when she was taken care of by someone else. Um, and then um, almost four years later, I got, when I got pregnant again, I brought in my secretary and my primary, primary colleague, who was the other extension specialist in, the, um, in our department, and told them I was pregnant. And my secretary said, I just, I just got my pregnancy test back. And I'm, so we had, my secretary and I had girls who were two and a half years apart, and they were both in the lab school. They both looked the same. They'd trade name tags and confuse the staff. Um, and then we ended up having uh, boys 15 days apart. So she, as a secretary, could not continue with two children in the job and decided that she wanted to stay home. So she provided child care for my children then. Um, and that was very handy. Um, it worked out well. And I remember the county educators saying, well, what was interesting is I started parent education before I had children. And for example, I would talk about um, adolescent development. And people would say, you're barely more than an adolescent yourself. But then when I had kids, then my introductions would be, and she has a child, so she knows what she's talking about. And then when I had two, then I definitely, you know, then they'd watch me. Um, you know, I became a target of I'm supposed to know everything. I'm supposed to handle it great. But that's when I started talking about how to deal with that pressure. Uh, and a lot of it was how to do parent education before you're a parent. And I would say, if I had 100 kids, I wouldn't know yours. Uh, my kids are unique. Your kids are unique. I know some things, but you know some things. So together, we'll try to find answers. And Sounds that was good. my primary philosophy. Right. Did did, did your children then, did they come to Purdue? No. Oh. Neither of them did. Okay. Um, my daughter went to Manchester College. Okay. And stayed there for eight years because she worked as a hall director and then in admissions afterwards. Um, my son was really interested in art, and Purdue is not the main sure. place to do art. He had a very good scholarship to the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. Oh, that's wonderful. So he got a degree in art. My daughter got an undergraduate degree in psychology with the same advisor I had, um, and a minor in music, and then did those other things. They both have moved to New York City and lived together, and um, he is actually building Velcro display boards, almost art, and my daughter is um, has a master's degree in um, school counseling, but the schools are not hiring in New York City. They've got a freeze on. So she is working as a personal assistant to George Soros, the billionaire. So she's getting some very interesting experiences. <laughs> sure she is. That sounds but good to my me. My son used to say that when he was living in Milwaukee, he said he'd get on the bus and he'd say, why did you do that to me? When I get on the bus and I see people interacting with their kids and I keep thinking, they're not doing it right. And they, they should be, he said, why did you make me think about those things? <laughs> uh, a couple of awards and honors. Uh, that Lilly Endowment Leadership Education Program and then the Sagamore, which is nice. Actually, they're connected. Okay. Oh. Um, well, Lil the Lilly came before. Uh, but it was at the bit. end, yeah. it was oh, at the end really of close. that. Yeah, um, Lilly started a program. Do they, excuse me, do they still have this? No. Uh, for the researchers, you might just, what's the type of the program? Um, Lilly Endowment was trying to to work with um, lo with Indiana programs, okay. and they were trying to work with some people to make Indiana the best place to raise a child, 
or a good place to raise a child, however they put it. Uh -huh. And they were working with the Center for Early Adolescence in um, North Carolina. And what they decided to do is locate some people who were leaders in, um, in ed well, youth education, that sort of thing, um, across Indiana and train them in the basic curricula of the Center for Early Adolescence. Um, so they had one round and then the second round I decided to apply and was accepted. So for that we were trained in a lot of these early adolescent programs, some for parents, some for schools, um, middle grades education programs and that sort of thing. So we had intensive training, um, all play, paid for by Lilly. And Where was the training done? Here? Or it was done in, most of it in Indianapolis. Lilly handled the training? Lilly hired, well they, they had the grant, they, they kind of okay. hired okay. the people to do that. To do the training. And actually at the end of, I think there was a third round, but at the end of those, that's when the um, Indiana Youth Institute was founded. So this kind of led up to the Youth Institute being founded and a lot of the same people were okay. involved. Um, and actually if you, there's a time capsule that some of the fellows contributed to and I sure. think one of my books is in there. So right. um, it's, it's really um, Lily trying to jumpstart some stuff. And um, what happened then was at the end of the second round, they submitted the names of all the fellows as Sagamores. And so this was kind of a group Sagamore, um, but it was Evan By. And, well, how um, did, uh, did, did you know when you went to the event that this is what you No, did? no, did we you, got... Did you, but you know about the award. Had you, did, some people don't even recognize what the award is. Oh, I knew what it was because okay. of seeing other people here at Purdue get okay, it and so okay. on. So, yeah, I did know what it was. Okay. Um, and it, it was an individual honor, but it was really more of a group honor, so... But you um, got it. That's but okay. we got it, yeah. Right, yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, I've got a Purdue tradition that uh, you'd like to share with us and an outstanding event. Um, I, I'm not sure. There were some departmental things. I, I was really impressed when I first started. There were things with that department that meant a lot. We would, the fact that I was a student moving in as a faculty member, right. yeah. the department was great for that at that point because I was treated as who I was, not as my status. Part of that was because our department had split not too long before that. At one point, we were moved from home, home ec into um, Hissey, and mm. then, and there were all these political things that you don't need all the details of that, and we got moved back, and we were okay. moved back. Half of the people went to psych, and half of the people went to CDFS, and, well, or stayed in CDFS, and that kind of decimated the department, so they hired lots of new assistant professors. So we didn't have enough, uh, enough senior professors to have our own primary committee when I first started there. And that meant that there were a lot of young people just starting out, and they were very flexible and energetic and all that sort of thing. So it was very collegial and not very competitive. And that meant that we, we were a great place to work. And I think you know it still has a sure. lot of that because we're dealing with human issues. Right. But it was, it was really very much that way at the beginning. So we would have parties, and the students would be invited, the graduate students, not the undergrads, and the, the secretaries and the faculty. Secretaries from other departments would come to work there and take a pay cut because it was such a great place for secretaries to work. That kind of um, we're all great. on the same level. We're all working together to accomplish the same thing and make a difference with families. That was something that meant a lot to me. Sure. Um, I, I think there are, there are a number of fun things, but a lot of it I've been observing more at, the, at a distance. My husband goes to all the sports stuff because he's taken pictures there. Sure. Um, and I think he really enjoys some of those traditions. and. That's nice. And um, I, re I really like the commitment to the land-grant mission and the fact that I can be here and rub elbows with people who are astronauts and, right. and, um, and be, um, be contributing in a different part of our lives. Sounds good. How about an outstanding event? Do you think, can you think of one or it doesn't have to be one, could be more than one? Um, yeah, I should have thought more about these ahead of time. That's all right. Um, outstanding events. Um, there, there have been some special events. My, my retirement reception was really fun. Okay. Brought in Tell some, um, 
my my secretary really was in charge of it, um, along with well, somebody has to a couple be. other people. And she just don't come to work and say we're doing it right. And she's wonderful. I mean, she is. She has been my colleague in many ways, not just my secretary. I would give her things that are just ideas, and she would create something much bigger. Um, <clears throat> so she was able to. Well, she brought in. Um, six or seven people to talk and she set up four tables plus some floor displays of all the stuff I have created. Uh, she wanted to make sure everybody saw everything that I had done, many of which she had laid out and done a beautiful job with. So that was a fun time to reflect back. But actually the, the event that we really ought to talk about probably is September 11, 2001. Um, I was home and watching the Today Show when it happened and I had already done some, I had been doing research on how parents and children talk about war and peace, and I thought, I need to send something out. So I went in to work and put together, I, I had done a piece after the Columbine shootings about how to talk to children about difficult topics, um, especially in the news, and so I just re-released that and said I'd be doing more things later in the afternoon and sent that out through the extension system in Indiana. And Ag Communications got back with me and said, we want to create a website. So I went and spent the rest, of, you know, I realized I didn't eat breakfast. You know, it was that kind of day, and sure. I thought, oh, I better eat something. But I went and sat in the, in the Department of Ag Communications working on some things. We got the website up before drive time that day, and the next day there were 6,000 visitors to the site. So that became my life for um, at least two weeks. I had constant phone calls. We had to put the website up and say, you're free to use this as long as you quote us and so on because everybody was calling asking oh, for permission. Yeah. And oh, yeah. I, I did nothing else. Luckily, I was not yet teaching at that point. Um, I was not teaching in the classroom. Um, so that really defined much of what I did. Eventually then that website well, it became the number one site, partly because my secretary knows how to optimize search engines, but um, it became the number one site when you look for children and terrorism. And it was linked to senators' sites, it was linked to schools and to um, religious institutions and just all over. And I, got call, I got a call from Mongolia uh, about that site. So it was, it was international and it just and hit the And timely, right on the... And being able to do it right afterwards, right. I think, was it was really wonderful that I had that support system that wanted to create that. Right. So that was really a, right. a big part of what defined what I did. Then when, when the, another big event that happened, which was not necessarily, it wasn't my doing and it wasn't necessarily what I would have chosen, but um, when with Martin Jiski's push to get professors in the classroom, um, and other things going on, they came to me and said, you're going to teach. Um, I had never taught in the classroom. I had spent 24 years with a full-time extension appointment, except with some grants now and then, and um, they told me you're going to teach in the classroom. So what that meant, it, and they said it's half time, but gave me a full-time assignment for a tenure track person. So it really got hard to do the extension work. Um, I tried to incorporate it. It was a huge shift in my thinking because teaching parents and families who come, who choose to come to the program can use the information immediately and want to do it. That's very different from students who don't even know what the name of the class is. They just know they're assigned to be there. I tried to spark their interest in outreach and I started doing some service learning things and so on, trying to connect those parts of my life. But that was never my primary calling, so that that was a little rough. Okay. What uh, retirement activities? What are your plans? Well, I'm I'm still adjusting to what I'm going to do. Okay. Um, I am doing you some should, consulting. It's so soon, so yeah, soon. it's it's only been about eight months. Yeah. Um, we will be moving to North Manchester, Indiana. We bought land there, and we'll be building a home. Um, we bought land several years ago with some friends. It w had been in the agricultural set-aside program, so we planted uh, 10,000 trees on 20 acres about 13 years ago, 13, 14 years ago, and they're getting decent size at this point, so there will be three or four uh, families who will be building there. 
one couple has already built there. And um, that's close to Manchester College where I can do some linkage, and that's also close to where my parents are in a home. So oh, that will be important. Um, but I do hope to continue to do a variety of things. I'm staying active with uh, peer review of articles. I enjoy doing that. I'm staying active with my, um, with my professional organization, the primary organization, the National Council on Family Relations. And I've worked with three other people, and we've just published an article that probably will become a rather central article looking at the difference between education and therapy and casework because that's been a really fuzzy kind of mm -hmm. thing. Family life education is not understood by ev everyone, and a lot of people don't. You know, They don't know what those boundaries are, and there really should be clear boundaries. So we've just been creating a model, looking at the domains of family practice. Um, I created a program called Parenting Piece by Piece um, about uh, 10, 15, 10 years ago, I think, 11 years ago. And that was because an educator came to me and said, a judge wants me to, talk, to do a program for abusive and, and uh, neglectful parents. And there really wasn't anything created for them. So we said, let's create a program. That got very wide use. And then people started wanting to use it in prisons. So I redid the uh, program and talked about how to translate it for parents who are in prison. And um, <clears throat> just released a new version of it in 2009 along with uh, CDs and DVDs and that sort of thing. That's nice. And that's getting used a lot nationally, and so I'm now more available to do trainings and to help people with those sorts of things. I'm consulting with the Military Family Research Institute that I thought I would never cooperate with, but I'm helping them develop programs sure. for working with families who are in the military. Because you're a good resource for that. And, nice. and the people who were developing the programs knew the content but didn't know how to make them into programs. Right. So I'm, I'm working with them. So I, I hope to continue doing some of those things. And I, I've talked, I've played around with uh, more books. I don't know exactly what I'll do, but I'm not, I'm, I'm too young to retire, but I, when I was okay. hired, we were considered federal employees as extension people, and so we had civil service retirement. And I, I stayed on that mostly due to inertia. I didn't realize how good a system it was. So I now have federal retirement. It allowed me to retire after 30 years, mm -hmm. and I did after 31 years. So it's it's a really, it's an opportunity for me to do what I you want to do. You got a lot going for you, and that's great, Judy. I really appreciate that. That's nice.